Welcome to this session entitled Common Scleroderma Test. I'm Rick Silver, Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina. And during this presentation, I will review some of the tests that scleroderma patients may undergo as part of their initial evaluation or subsequent follow-up. There are many different tests that you as a scleroderma patient may undergo. Some tests are useful for diagnosis and are usually done only once during the initial evaluation. Other tests are useful for monitoring disease activity and they may be performed at regular intervals. And then some tests are useful for both diagnosis and monitoring. It's important to keep in mind that testing must be individualized and based on the clinical needs. Patients may not require all of the tests discussed in this presentation. Let's begin by discussing some of the blood tests that might be used to help diagnose systemic sclerosis. This slide shows the classification criteria for scleroderma, which were revised in 2013. At the bottom where the yellow arrow appears, you see a number of different autoantibodies that are useful in classifying patients and even subclassifying patients into various disease subsets. An important blood test used to screen patients for connective tissue disease is the antinuclear antibody assay or ANA. The gold standard for performing the ANA test is the indirect fluorescence assay. In this assay, cells containing abundant nuclei are plated on a glass slide, and patient serum is allowed to incubate on this slide. If the serum contains antibodies directed against the nuclear proteins, they will adhere the rest of the serum is then washed off and a second antibody is applied. And this antibody is directed against the human autoantibodies and has a fluorescent tag. This will then be washed off and if indeed the patient's serum contains autoantibodies that have bound to the antigens in the nuclei, they will be detected by the fluorescein tag. And when viewed under a fluorescent microscope, the technician will see a pattern such as this. The, these autoantibodies or antinuclear antibodies are present in nearly all patients with scleroderma, but they're also present in a host of other conditions, including some normal individuals. So when present, the ANA tests should be followed up with more specific autoantibody testing. When autoantibodies have been detected with the screening ANA test, and if scleroderma is suspected, then more specific autoantibody testing should be performed. This slide complements of Dr. Fergali Bostwick illustrates the nine known scleroderma-related autoantibodies that are commercially available. And you can see that these autoantibodies fall into certain disease types. For example, the antisyntramere antibody is seen most often in people with the limited cutaneous form of systemic sclerosis. Whereas the topoisomerase autoantibody or SCL70 antibody is seen in people with diffuse scleroderma as is the RNA polymerase 3 autoantibody. So these three, RNA polymerase 3, topoisomerase, and antisyntramere antibodies are the major scleroderma autoantibodies. They are mutually exclusive, that is, people won't have more than one of these autoantibodies. And they now uh, form one of the criteria for the 2013 classification criteria. The other scleroderma-related autoantibodies are far less common. 
they often occur in people with an overlap with another connective tissue disease, such as polymyositis or dermatomyositis. The scleroderma-associated autoantibodies are important not only for diagnosing and classifying patients with scleroderma, they also are valuable in terms of prognosis. So we know, for example, that patients with the anti-centromere antibody are prone to develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. Patients with the topoisomerase autoantibody or SCL70 antibody are at high risk for developing interstitial lung disease. And patients who have the RNA polymerase 3 autoantibody, in addition to having rapidly progressive skin thickening, are at high risk for developing kidney problems, particularly scleroderma renal crisis. So these sort of autoantibody testing should be done in all patients with scleroderma at the initial evaluation. And they tend to be mutually exclusive. It's very uncommon for a patient to have more than one of these particular autoantibodies. In addition to autoantibody testing, there are other important lab tests that are done at the initial evaluation and may be done in subsequent follow-up. This would include a complete blood cell count, a metabolic panel, which would measure kidney function and liver function tests, as well as muscle enzyme testing and uh, a urinalysis. Next, I want to talk about nail fold capillary morphology. And as you can see on this slide from the 2013 classification criteria, the presence of abnormal nail fold capillaries is one of the criteria for the classification of systemic sclerosis. Nail fold capillary abnormalities may be detected in a number of different ways. And some of the methods are shown here. This is a stereo microscope. This is what we use at MUSC to look at the capillaries which are present just uh, before the cuticle on each fingernail. Um, many institutions don't have a stereo microscope in their rheumatology clinic, but most clinics will have access to a dermatoscope, which can also be used to visualize these small blood vessels. And the um, probably the most sophisticated way to look at uh, capillaries is a video capillaroscope, uh, which takes incredibly uh, detailed pictures of the capillaries. On this slide, we have some illustrations of capillaries or capillary loops in the nail bed. Uh, on your left, in figure A, you see these very delicate, regularly spaced capillary loops that look like hairpins, very regularly arrayed. Uh, this is seen through a video capillaroscope. And on the right here is the way they would appear when using a dermatoscope. Again, you see these very regularly arrayed uh, capillaries at the nail fold margin. Contrast that to what you might see in a patient with scleroderma, because this is, of course, a microvascular disease. And here in this scleroderma patient, you see that the capillaries are greatly enlarged, and that there are areas where there has been dropout or loss of capillaries. This is with the capillaroscope, and here's with the dermatoscope. Again, you can see that some of the capillary loops are larger than normal, and there are areas of avascularity where the capillaries are not present. And in addition, we often will see some hemorrhage in the cuticular part of the nail. This can be very useful in distinguishing scleroderma uh, from a more benign condition, such as benign, uh, primary Raynaud's phenomenon. So it's a very useful test, and now is part of the 2013 classification criteria. 
skin-related criteria form an important part of the 2013 classification criteria. So skin thickening proximal to the metacarpal phalangeal joints, your large knuckles, is sufficient for the classification of scleroderma, the giving you a score of nine, which is sufficient for the diagnosis. Some patients, however, will not have skin thickening in those areas, and it may simply be confined to the skin over the fingers, so-called sclerodactyly, which gives you four points. So since skin is a very important part of the disease and of the classification criteria, let's talk about the scoring of skin thickness. Let's look at the modified Rodnan skin score. Okay. Hello, I'm Rick Silver, and we're here at the Medical University of South Carolina, and we're here to demonstrate to you the modified Rodnan skin score. And I have with me Patty, who's one of our support group leaders for the South Carolina chapter of the uh, Scleroderma Foundation. So thank you, Patty, for being a volunteer today. <laughs> the um, modified Rodman skin score uh, was developed in the 1980s uh, by Dr. Gerald Rodman, who was um, one of the pioneers in scleroderma clinical research and was at the University of Pittsburgh. At the time, there were several other skin scores being uh, studied or tested. There was one here in, at the Medical University of South Carolina and another one at UCLA. But eventually, the scleroderma research community settled on Dr. Rodnan's skin score and they modified it somewhat, hence the term modified Rodnan skin score. And the purpose of the skin score is to um, ascertain the extent and the degree of skin thickening. It may be used in routine clinical practice, although its major use is in clinical trials. So when you're testing a pharmaceutical agent to see its effect on the skin uh, and you're in a clinical trial, uh, the rheumatologist or dermatologist will often do the modified Rodnan skin score at the beginning and at several time points throughout the uh, study and at the end. Uh, the skin score is easy to perform. It's, of course, non-invasive. It's important for the patient to be comfortable. We like, of course, for the room to be warm uh, so that the patient isn't experiencing Raynaud's phenomenon or any discomfort. They can uh, should be in a robe or um, loose-fitting clothing. Uh, and uh, then the way the test is done is to uh, look at skin thickness in 17 different regions of the body and to uh, add those scores from each of those regions. So, for example, we will test the skin thickness in the fingers, on the dorsum of the hand, the forearm, the upper arm on both sides, the thigh, the leg, and the foot on both sides, and then the face, the anterior chest, and the abdomen. And for each one of those regions, the range in skin score thickness is from zero to three. Zero being normal skin thickness, three being the extreme thickening uh, where the skin cannot even be pinched, and one and two would be mild and moderate skin thickness, respectively. So those are then calculated and summed, and that is the modified Rodnan skin score. The way that the test is done uh, involves uh, either using, pinching the skin between the thumb and the index finger, or some investigators will use two fingers, like two thumbs, to pinch the skin in this fashion. So we begin in the fingers, and we try and pinch the skin, and this is a little bit tight. I would grade that as a one on the dorsum of the hand. You see this skin is looser, and that is probably a zero. And the forearm, a little bit tighter. 
that is probably a one and then the upper arm on the outer portion here also a little bit tight but not very tight at all so maybe a one there and on the face um, we check here on the lateral aspect of the cheek and this skin you can see is very pliable and I would say that is a zero on the chest we pinch on the outer area on both sides you can see that this skin is very soft and thin and that would be a zero and this is, test is done similarly in the abdomen and the lower extremities and one can then sum that up um, and the range could be either from zero to a maximum of 51. So if um, the assessor is trained in doing the modified rod and skin score and is consistent in the way that he or she performs it, it has a great deal of reliability uh, and the uh, variation between one investigator and another, both of whom have been trained, uh, is actually quite small and um, the variation from time to time by the same investigator is also uh, quite good. So this test has been um, adopted by uh, the scleroderma clinical trials community uh, to um, be one of the endpoints for studies of medications that might be useful in patients with scleroderma. Um, the skin score will decline or reduce or improve uh, over time uh, even without any treatment. The trajectory of that decline or improvement in the skin score is highly variable from one patient to another. Um, but it will generally decline as part of the natural course of the disease. And currently, um, a new uh, composite endpoint for clinical trials has been developed by the American College of Rheumatology, uh, where the skin score is a component of several other measurements, including the force vital capacity, uh, one of the pulmonary function tests, as well as uh, uh, subjective um, uh, assessment of the patient's improvement of herself or the physician's um, uh, subjective feelings about the patient's uh, improvement and a disability questionnaire. That's the CRISS, C-R-I-S-S, uh, Composite Response Index for Systemic Sclerosis. And the skin score remains a very valuable uh, component of that uh, composite score. The hallmark of scleroderma is, of course, thickening of the skin, although there are some patients who do not have any apparent skin involvement. So let's say a few words about skin biopsy. The first is that skin biopsy is not required for diagnosis, although it may be useful uh, in some atypical presentations. More often than not, the skin biopsy is performed as part of a clinical trial or for research purposes. On the right, you see an example of a skin biopsy showing a very thickened layer of dermis, the layer of skin below the epidermis. So when a skin biopsy is performed, routine pathology or histology can be obtained, and one can even stain this for collagen and other uh, proteins that are produced excessively by patients with scleroderma. Also, the um, skin biopsy can be used for molecular biologic uh, examination, looking for an overexpression of genes or proteins associated with fibrosis. And finally, uh, some patients will undergo skin biopsy for research purposes, and in such cases, the fibroblasts or other cell types may be grown and used for studies in the laboratory. This video will demonstrate a punch skin biopsy. I'm Rick Silver at the Medical University of South Carolina, and today we're going to demonstrate a punch skin biopsy 
uh, in a patient with scleroderma. So uh, with me today is Brittany Frazier, my clinical trials coordinator. She's going to assist me. And uh, then we have Pam, who is a patient who's entering a clinical trial. And uh, this is her baseline visit for the clinical trial. And uh, part of the protocol for this particular study is to have a punch skin biopsy. This will be done at the beginning of the trial and again at the end of the trial. Um, just a word about skin biopsies. They're not really required for the diagnosis of scleroderma. Um, however, they may be useful in confirming a diagnosis if the uh, clinical features are um, atypical. Uh, but more often than not, the biopsy is done for research purposes, either for a clinical trial or um, to grow cells uh, from the skin itself. So um, this is part of a clinical trial, and we've uh, had Pam sign a consent form. Do you understand the procedure that we're going to do today? Yes, okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is simply mark your skin here with a pen to make uh, mark my spot. And usually um, we biopsy the forearm on the upper side, the dorsum, uh, some midway between the wrist and the elbow, uh, if that skin, in fact, is involved. Uh, so we need to uh, clean the skin, and I'm going to get the chloroprep for that. Now the skin has been cleaned. And we're going to now um, inject some anesthetic, local anesthetic. This is lidocaine, similar to Novocaine that the dentist might use. It also has a little bit of epinephrine in it to constrict the blood vessels and reduce the, any bleeding that might occur. So you're going to feel a little pinch and a little burning. And we just infiltrate the skin around the site that we will biopsy. You doing okay? Mm -hmm. And we usually use about three milliliters of lidocaine with 1% epinephrine. And we'll let that sit for just a minute. And this is the biopsy instrument. This is a, we'll take a three millimeter biopsy and we'll do two of those side by side. I'm just gonna to test to see if you're numbed up. You feel that, is it sharp? Feel pressure, but not sharp? Just a light touch. Okay, good. Right. And we're going to put some downward pressure and then twist, and that will cut through the dermis. You should just feel some pressure. Did you feel that? Was it uncomfortable? Good. Okay. And we're going to go right next to it for the second biopsy. There we go. This is going in a different container with a buffer and in, uh, to inhibit some of the enzymes so that 
It can be studied for molecular biologic purposes. And we're done. How was that? Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And we're going to put uh, just a little pressure dressing on that until the bleeding stops. And you'll be good to go as long as you keep it clean and dry. And this will heal in a couple of, um, in about a week or so. And if you have any trouble, you know to contact us. Okay. And this is the hardest part that Brittany's going to help me with. <laughs> red is your, your red, white, and blue today. As you know, many patients with scleroderma may have involvement of their lungs, producing shortness of breath or other respiratory symptoms. Two of the complications of scleroderma affecting the lungs, pulmonary arterial hypertension and interstitial lung disease, now are among the criteria for the classification of systemic sclerosis. So in the next several slides, I'm going to talk about interstitial lung disease and pulmonary arterial hypertension, focusing on the testing that may be performed to diagnose and follow each of these complications. When fibrosis affects the lungs, it's known as interstitial lung disease, or ILD. ILD is a frequent complication and may be serious, so early diagnosis is important. Symptoms of ILD include shortness of breath and cough, and the cough is usually non-productive. ILD is diagnosed by a clinical examination supplemented by pulmonary function testing and often by imaging of the chest, particularly with a CT scan. In the next few slides, I will review the clinical exam the pulmonary function test, and the CT scan. Physical examination should include careful listening of the breath sounds over the chest. or normal breath sounds in the upper zones of the chest. And these are fine crackles heard at the bases of the lungs. frequent sign of interstitial lung disease. In addition to a thorough physical examination, all patients should undergo pulmonary function tests. I recommend that the PFTs be performed at the baseline visit and at various intervals following diagnosis. It's important that the PFTs be done in a laboratory that adheres to standards created by the American Thoracic Society. Some patients may need an adapter mouthpiece because it's very important that the mouthpiece fit properly. And some patients may have reduced oral aperture and difficulty uh, using a regular sized mouthpiece. In such cases, a pediatric or an adapter mouthpiece should be used. And a number of different pulmonary function tests are performed, including spirometry, measurement of lung volumes, the measurement of the diffusion capacity, and often we will also do exercise testing. Routine pulmonary function testing includes spirometry, which measures a number of different factors, including the FVC or force vital All right, capacity. ready to do another spirometry? Yes, Let's okay. see a demonstration of spirometric testing. Okay. All right, normal breathing. All right, ready to do another spirometry? Yes. Okay. One more normal breath in and All right, out. Normal breathing. All right, big breath in. 
Bullseye! Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Don't give up. You're almost empty. Push, push, push. All right. Big breath back in. Excellent job. Take your breath. Recover. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, don't give up, you're almost empty, push, push, push. All right, big breath back in. Excellent job. Catch your breath, recover. Another important pulmonary function test is the diffusion capacity. All right, we can go ahead and begin. Okay, lips nice and tight. We're going to be breathing in some gas for this test. We'll just start with normal breaths. We're going to be breathing in some gas for this test. We'll just start with normal breaths. One more normal breath in and out. Gentle big breath. Gently blow it out all the way. Keep going. Keep going. There's a little bit more breath to blow. Keep going. All right. Biggest breath possible. Fill up those lungs and hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You've got three seconds. Two seconds. One second. Blow it out. All of it. Get rid of it. Keep going. Keep going. Just a little bit more. And you can take it out. Catch your breath and recover. Good job. All right. Take it out. Catch your breath and recover. Good job. Another important pulmonary function test is the six-minute walk test. The six-minute walk test is a submaximal exercise test performed in the hallway of the rheumatology or the pulmonology clinic. It measures the distance in meters walked in a six-minute period of time. Other measurements include the blood pressure and the heart rate and the oxygen saturation. In most routine labs, the oxygen saturation is measured by an oximeter that is placed on the finger or the thumb. But as you know, in patients with Raynaud's phenomenon and scleroderma, such measurements are unreliable. And so we use an oximeter that fits around the forehead and is not affected by the peripheral circulation. In the next slide, we'll demonstrate the six-minute walk test. This video will demonstrate performance of the six-minute walk test. Okay. All right, so our objective is distance. We're going to be going back and forth as many times as we can between the orange cones. Okay. Try to turn briskly at the cones when you get down to each point. When we reach the end of the six minutes, I'll stop you right where you are. Okay. Any questions? Nope. All right, you can go. Okay. You're at one minute. Doing great. Okay, 
This will probably be her last lap heading back. Ten seconds to go. All right, and you can stop. Great job. A CT chest scan is essential for the evaluation of interstitial lung disease. A CT or CAT scan stands for Computed Tomography Scan, which combines a series of X-ray images taken from different angles and creates a sequence of images like slices of the bones and soft tissues inside your body, even the very small structures such as tiny blood vessels. Depending on what part of your body is being scanned, you may be asked to wear a gown and remove any metal items such as a belt, jewelry and glasses, which might interfere with the images. Once in the scanning room, the technologist will ask you to lie on a comfortable bed that moves up and down and back and forth. You may be asked to take a special dye called contrast media, which helps highlight specific parts of your body on the scan. Contrast media may be given to you as a drink or as an injection. You may experience a warm feeling or a metallic taste in your mouth. Once you're comfortable, the technologist leaves the scanning room to control the examination from a console next door. The technologist will be able to see, hear, and speak to you at all times via intercom and through the viewing window. You may be asked to hold your breath at certain points to avoid blurring the images. The table gently moves you into the scanner and its detectors rotate around you as it completes each separate view. You may hear buzzing, clicking, and whirring noises. CT scans expose you to a small amount of radiation. The dose depends on what type of scan you receive and is always kept as low as possible while making sure that the image quality is good for an accurate diagnosis. All doses are considered low dose and newer machines and techniques require even less radiation than was previously used. The risk of missing a serious disorder by not having a medically appropriate CT scan is considerably greater than the risks of the scan itself. But like any medical test, if it's not needed, it should not be performed. Contrast media is iodine-based, and in just a few patients, it can cause an allergic reaction. Please tell your doctor and let us know if you are or think you may be allergic to contrast media or iodine. Patients who have diabetes or renal disease require special care because the kidneys are involved with filtering iodine from the bloodstream. The examination usually takes between 10 minutes and half an hour. If there are any specific instructions you need to follow before the kind of CT scan you are having, these will be sent to you prior to your appointment. You can resume your normal activities immediately after the procedure. If you were given contrast, you may receive special instructions. In some cases, you may be asked to wait for a short time before leaving to ensure that you feel well after the exam. After the scan, you'll likely be told to drink lots of fluids to help your kidneys flush the contrast material from your body. A specialty radiology physician will analyze your images and send a report to your doctor, usually within 24 hours. The CT scan used to diagnose interstitial lung disease is known as the high resolution CT scan because of the many thin sections taken from the very top of the lungs to the very base of the lungs, enabling the radiologist to examine all aspects of the lung. Contrast is not usually administered for this particular exam. On the left, you see a normal CT scan where the lung fields are dark, indicating the presence of air, but not a lot of, or any fibrosis. Contrast that on the right the CT scan of a patient with interstitial lung disease where a significant part of this particular part of the lung shows inflammation as indicated by this haziness or ground glass opacification 
and some enlargement of the smaller airways due to fibrosis. The CT scan is very helpful in assessing the presence and the degree of interstitial lung disease and can be repeated at regular intervals to assess the patient's response to treatment. Turning now to the other major pulmonary complication of scleroderma, pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. Early diagnosis of PAH is vitally important because treatment at an early stage is going to be much more effective than treatment at a later stage of the disease. Screening tests are performed at the baseline and at regular intervals. The screening tests include the physical examination. However, the physical examination is not very sensitive for the detection of early PAH. Screening tests also include the pulmonary function tests, in particular the diffusion capacity, which can sometimes be very low in patients with PAH. And the other screening test is the echocardiogram, which can be useful in estimating the pressures on the right side of the heart, which would be elevated in people with pulmonary arterial hypertension. If either of these features suggests the presence of pulmonary arterial hypertension, then a right-sided heart catheterization is required to confirm the diagnosis. In the next few slides, we'll talk about the echocardiogram and the right heart catheterization. The echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. This is a completely non-invasive technique that should be performed at baseline in all patients with scleroderma and should be re repeated at regular intervals depending on the degree of suspicion for heart involvement, including pulmonary arterial hypertension. On your left is a four-chamber view of an echocardiogram. You have the right atrium and right ventricle and the left atrium and left ventricle with the interventricular septum here and the tricuspid valve shown here. You can appreciate the fact from this echo that the right atrium and right ventricle are enlarged compared to the left atrium and left ventricle, and this is certainly suggestive of the presence of pulmonary hypertension. When the technician can detect regurgitation of blood flow from the right ventricle to the right atrium, when the heart contracts, this can be measured with a Doppler as shown here in blue. The velocity of that regurgitant jet can then be depicted and measured on, as shown on this oscilloscope. And the velocity of that regurgitant jet can be plugged into a formula that then estimates the pressures in the pulmonary artery. This is an estimate only, and if it does suggest the presence of pulmonary hypertension, it needs to be confirmed with a more definitive measurement of pressure, and that would involve a right heart catheterization. The right heart catheter is the most important diagnostic tool for pulmonary hypertension, and given a thorough introduction, not complicated to use. It is the only device capable of measuring a number of otherwise inaccessible hemodynamic parameters. Its workings are based on the principle of communicating vessels. The rhythmical changes of the blood pressure values in the heart are transmitted via the liquid inside the lumen of the catheter to a measuring device outside the body. One function of the balloon at the tip is to guide the catheter to its desired destination. After the balloon has been inflated, it is taken up by the venous bloodstream and flow directed to and subsequently through the right side of the heart. On its way through the heart to the pulmonary artery, 
It measures pressure in the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery itself. Additional hemodynamic parameters can be calculated from these direct invasive measurements taken with the catheter. The right heart cat. While we utilize the echocardiogram and in some cases the right heart catheterization, in other situations, patients may require additional cardiac testing. This depends on the individual clinical situation and certainly does not apply to all patients with scleroderma. But among the other cardiac testing that may be needed in individual patients are the EKG, cardiac monitoring, stress test, cardiac MRI, and left heart catheterization with coronary angiography. Upper endoscopy, EGD. Upper endoscopy is a test that looks inside the upper gastrointestinal or GI tract. The GI tract includes the esophagus, stomach, and the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. The test is also known as esophagogastroduodenoscopy, or EGD. It's done using a tool called an endoscope, which is a long, thin, flexible tube that has a light and a tiny camera. The test helps find problems such as ulcers, infection, or growths. It can show the causes of swallowing problems, nausea and vomiting, acid reflux, bleeding, and abdominal pain. Before the procedure. Before the procedure, you may have a physical exam, blood tests, or other kinds of tests. You'll be asked not to eat or drink for at least eight hours before the procedure. Tell your healthcare provider about all medicines and supplements you take, if you have any allergies, and if you're pregnant or might be pregnant. Your healthcare provider will explain what happens during the procedure. He or she will also talk with you about any risks or complications that may happen. You'll be asked to sign a consent form that gives your healthcare provider permission to do the procedure. Read the form carefully and ask questions if anything is not clear. What to expect? An upper endoscopy takes about 20 to 30 minutes. When it's time for your test, you may be given medicine to help you relax or sleep. This is called sedation. This medicine is usually given through an IV line put in a vein in your arm or hand. Your throat may be numbed with a spray or liquid, and you'll be given a small plastic guard to protect your teeth. During the test, you lie on your left side the endoscope is placed in your mouth and moved down your throat. Air is used to expand the GI tract so your provider can see the lining more clearly. You may feel some pressure or discomfort from the air. The scope sends pictures of the GI tract to a video screen. Your provider looks at your esophagus, stomach, and duodenum for problems such as bleeding, inflammation, or growths. Using small tools inserted through channels in the endoscope, he or she can take small samples of tissue to send to a lab. This is called a biopsy. In some cases, your provider will remove small growths. The endoscope is then removed. After the procedure. After the test, you'll need to rest for about an hour to let the sedation wear off. This kind of medicine lasts for a while in the body, so you'll need a family member or friend to drive you home. Plan to take it easy for the rest of the day. If you had a biopsy, the results will be ready in about seven days. Call your healthcare provider if you have any of the following. Nausea and vomiting. Vomiting blood. Stomach pain that doesn't go away. Black, tarry, or bloody stools. Trouble swallowing or fever. Things to remember. EGD is a test that looks inside the upper gastrointestinal or GI tract for problems. Small samples of tissue may be taken for testing. You will need to have someone drive you home. You will not be allowed to drive because of sedation. What we have learned. An upper endoscopy is done to look at the large intestine and colon, true or false? The answer is false. 
upper endoscopy looks inside the esophagus, stomach, and the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. You can drive yourself home right after the test. True or false? The answer is false. Because sedation lasts for a while in the body, you'll need someone else to drive you home. I'm Dr. Reg Bell, and this is Kate. Kate's our nurse practitioner who runs our GI lab in the office here. And she's going to talk to us about how we do a 24-hour impedance pH test. Kate? So most of the time you have the motility test right before this, and that kind of also tells me where to place the catheter, how deep to go. It's a very small, thin catheter. It is visible. Um, we want you to try to carry on normal activities uh, during the day. Uh, don't go home and be a couch potato uh, with this in. So anyhow, I, uh, I'm going to put this in. Let's see, what side do we do? Left side. Your left. Okay. So there's a little bit of goop, goop on the end of this. So uh, tuck your chin down for me. You're going to feel this in your nose, breathe through your mouth. There's a little pressure. I might make your eyes water. There you go. So sip and swallow, and as you swallow, I'm going to advance this down. There we go. Okay. And then we're going to tape it in place. You can't get this little computer wet, so uh, no showering until it comes out. So this is what the computer looks like, and it'll be important for you to push some buttons during the test, and I'll go over with these in the office. Anytime you eat or drink anything, I want you to hit the fork and spoon. And when you're done eating and drinking, you hit the fork and spoon with a line through it. Only drink water in between meals, but during meals you can have whatever you want. The machine deletes meal time, so I don't want you to have a three hour dinner. But that said, most reflux happens after a meal, so I also don't want you to fast for 24 hours. When you go to bed at night, you're going to hit this little button here. It's a guy laying down on a bed. And when you get up in the morning, you hit this guy that's upright. The three green buttons are associated with symptoms that you may have. And we'll go over those when you come back into the office. He's done his 24 hours. And we're going to take this out. I shut down the computer already. Boogers are going to come, so feel free to blow your nose when I have this out. Big deep breath. There. Oh. There. Nice job. I'll analyze these test results. And have you look at them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are a number of additional gastrointestinal procedures which are not necessarily carried out in all scleroderma patients, but certainly could be used in selected clinical situations. Esophageal dilation is done quite commonly during the EGD procedure when patients are complaining of dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Colonoscopy is performed as part of health maintenance or may be performed when looking for a site of gastrointestinal bleeding. If the EGD and the colonoscopy do not reveal a source of bleeding and bleeding is still suspected, 
then a small bowel capsule endoscopy may be performed. If bleeding is detected either from the stomach, the small bowel, or the large bowel, this might be treatable endoscopically with laser therapy. Hydrogen breath test is employed when patients are suspected of having small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and this test can confirm the presence of that complication. And the gastric emptying study is performed as a nuclear medicine procedure to document the motility of the stomach and is a useful study when patients are complaining of bloating or filling up easily after a meal and gastric dysmotility is suspected. And a number of barium studies may still be employed in selected situations. Moving now from tests of the GI tract to tests of the kidney, one of the feared complications of scleroderma is scleroderma renal crisis. This is a true medical emergency. It's characterized by high elevation of the blood pressure, often with a decline in the kidney function, a decrease in urinary output, and abnormalities on the urinalysis, as well as some abnormalities seen in the blood counts and in the blood smear. In some cases where scleroderma renal crisis is suspected, a kidney biopsy may be performed basically to confirm the presence of scleroderma involving the kidneys and to exclude other potential causes for kidney failure. The figure on your left illustrates a percutaneous biopsy of the kidney in this case being performed under ultrasound guidance. And on the right, a small sample of tissue from the biopsy of the kidney that shows the typical findings of scleroderma renal crisis. Often a renal biopsy will not be necessary, but I include this slide because it is one test that some patients with scleroderma may undergo. This concludes this presentation on common scleroderma tests. As noted before, some tests are useful for diagnosis and will be performed at the time of initial evaluation. Some tests are useful for monitoring the activity of the disease and will be performed at regular intervals. And some tests are useful both for diagnosis and monitoring. When Discussing these common scleroderma tests, please keep in mind that not all of these tests will be warranted in every patient, and they must be individualized to the particular patient and the particular clinical need. I thank you for your attention, and I hope to be available during the question and answer session.